Dr. Cliff Show. We are here live again. I'm Dr. Cliff Olson, audiologist and founder of Applied Hearing Solutions in Phoenix, Arizona, and this is my co-host. I'm Dr. Rachel Cook. I'm also an audiologist at Applied Hearing Solutions. Thanks everyone for coming back to tune in for our second episode. Uh, like you just said, we are definitely going to be talking about OTC today. Absolutely. What else would we be talking New about today? New in the today? news, right? Exactly. So today's show, um, we're going to review the background and kind of the, the history of over-the-counter hearing aids and how they've progressed over time. Um, we're going to review the FDA register document that was released that covers the rules and regulations of these new classes of devices. If you haven't been working out, you probably won't even be able to lift it because it's 200 pages long. And we'll show you it later. It's huge. Um, we're also going to discuss some positives and negatives of over-the-counter hearing aids because, of course, there's always going to be two sides to that. And end with uh, questions from the audience. So please let us know if you have any questions throughout the duration of this show. We'd love to answer them. So. Um, this is also going to be part of a three episode series on OTC and prescription hearing aids. So this week is going to be all about OTC. Next week is going to be about prescription hearing aids. And the following week will be all about a direct comparison between the two. Um, so make sure that you are subscribed to the channels here, yeah. guys, because you do not want to miss these future episodes that we're going to be doing. You'll probably be fired up from today's episode. So just make sure that you have notifications turned on and uh, join us in the next couple of weeks as well. Absolutely. OK, well, before we do any of these things, uh, I need to jump into a quick sponsor segment real quick. So we're very, very thankful for all of our sponsors here. Uh, they of course keep the show going as they say so uh, first and foremost today we have a company called Eosera and Eosera has the first comprehensive line of ear care products these are going to be things for ear pain ear itch ear wax irrigation and more uh, last week we talked about their product earwax MD which That's we right. use in the office to get the the really tricky wax out of there um, but today I wanted to highlight ear itch MD um, so one report that we get in the yeah. itchy itchy ear canals um, if you have seasonal allergies or you live somewhere where there's a higher humidity, you might find yourself trying to scratch around in there. Uh, as you Never know, we definitely don't recommend Q-tips. Um, we know better than to do that, right? So uh, Ear Itch MD uses some naturally occurring and essential oils in there to uh, moisturize the skin of the ear canal and kind of revitalize and calm those those dry itchy ear canals um, it's great for people who use hearing aids it's great for people who wear headphones a lot of the time um, or just overall if you've got some itchy ear canals for sure so, and it lasts all day so why not that it does so you can get uh, most of their products they've got a whole line of products at CVS Walmart Walgreens and most national retailers and if you go to their website and order products through their website at eosera.com, you can use the promo code CLIFF20, and that will give you 20% off your entire purchase. Right on. All right. So thank you to Eosera for that. Um, now let's talk about the background of over-the-counter hearing aids, because um, technically over-the-counter hasn't been available, uh, and still technically is not available until we get later in the year, but direct-to-consumer hearing aids have been around for a while, um, and a lot of these products are going to naturally migrate into the over-the-counter hearing aid category. So right. let's talk about a couple of the maybe direct-to-consumer hearing aids that you guys might be familiar with already. Uh, one of them is Bose. So mm -hmm. you have the Bose sound control hearing aids now they have since gotten rid of the Bose sound control hearing aids those are over with Lexi right now um, and then you have Ergo so Ergo is a company that a lot of people are familiar with they're really clever with their marketing and all of that really fun yeah, marketing fun whimsical marketing, for marketing sure. uh, which is fun um, there's a couple other products out there that are more like uh, I don't know unreputable direct-to-consumer um, mm -hmm. I don't want to mention their names because I don't want to give them any publicity <laughs> through this channel but um, there are some companies out there who have not been doing things the right way and um, you know when you start to look at it uh, these uh, hearing aids that we have currently the the prescription hearing aids that everyone talks about those are the hearing aids that we typically dispense inside of audiology clinics right and one of the main reasons I guess that, that it, I think a lot of this is a good thing that's coming out is that all of this stuff has been unregulated yep 
Wild, right? wild like, west. Completely. That's what I've referred to it as. Right? And, and companies can do whatever the heck they want. Mm -hmm. um, we kind of organized a group of audiologists to actually send letters into the FDA and the FTC for some of these companies that have been uh, deliberately illegally marketing their products and the FDA did nothing. They said, well, we're working on it and, yeah. and this is really what we have to show for it. But um, let's give you a little bit more background then of the legislative history with it. Absolutely. So, like you said, uh, direct-to-consumer devices, um, or what a lot of people would probably think of as over-the-counter hearing aids, amplifiers, if you will, um, in the past were just wildly unregulated. Um, and so there was a uh, bipartisan bill that was introduced in Congress in 2016. That never that, happens, by the way, bipartisan. I know, I know. This I know. Is a political and of course show. it's for um, hearing aids, which is yeah. just cool. That, yeah, absolutely. That I think everyone can kind of agree on hearing aids. I hopefully hope so. so. I mean. um, hopefully not too controversial, but we'll get into that today. Uh, that was introduced in 2016, and then um, the FDRAR Reauthorization Act in 2017 was actually passed, and that was to establish a new category of OTC devices. And when that was passed, that really just meant that the FDA was told, okay, hey, it's time for legislation to get started on this, or it's time for a uh, you to we got to create the category. We got to create you know, a category like, of devices. Because there, there's here. nothing yet. We got to create something. So right, right. we got to do it. Um, then that was supposed to be finalized in 2020. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <COVID>. We <laughs> all know what happened in 2020. Um, and so it was pretty much put on pause for a while there. And uh, until President Joe Biden, he came out with an exit. listen, this is already, you know, years past of where it essentially should have been, um, I guess a year past, but um, wanted wanted to get the ball moving on that. And so they did. Uh, they finally opened up for comment in 2021. And that was in October of 2021. And they ended up receiving over a thousand comments oh, yeah. uh, about the good, the bad, the ugly, why this is a great idea, why this is an awful idea. Um, and then finally, last week, they came out with this <laughs> textbook of a document. Uh, it is 200 pages. I have read every page. <sighs> it took it's forever, miserable. and yeah. it was just about as exciting and as thrilling as you would think that yeah. it would be. Um, but yeah, anyway, we wanted to make sure that we had all they the information for today. They basically addressed everything. I mean, they, I hope so. Yeah, I mean, they I, had enough time to, so. No, no pushing that to yeah. 300 pages. So now when, is, when are we supposed to actually be enforced on this though? 60 days from issuance of this final ruling. So they basically put it out there um, and then they've got 60 days to put their final rules out and really establish this in place. And so that should be um, October 17th of this year. Okay, okay. Yeah. So we got, a, so pretty we got soon. a couple months to go. Yep. All right, so what, what's the rationale behind all of this? I mean, when you really look at it, the, the FDA, the federal government, they were just looking, uh, you know, the, um, the, the individuals who put this together, what was their reasoning for actually having bipartisan, you know, agreements on this? And it was to increase affordability and accessibility of hearing aids and to regulate all of the crazy stuff that is going on out there right now. And I really, I'm trying to refrain from this because I get really uh, impassioned about uh, companies that go out there and deliberately rip off individuals with hearing loss, but there's a lot of them out there. And the real big hope, for me anyway, is that this regulation is actually going to prevent a lot of that from happening. Right. Um, of course, we'll have to see on that, but we'll talk about that here a little bit. But, you know, from an affordability and accessibility standpoint, you know, there's a lot of individuals out there who do not get hearing aids because they don't believe that they can afford hearing aids. Right. And this is going to be one way to actually make something that's direct to consumer that you do not have to go in and get a hearing test from mm -hmm. a hearing care professional right. like us. Um, and you can self treat to a degree. Um, and I really think that they're trying to hit the, the mild to moderate uh, hearing loss category. In fact, this is exactly the group of individuals that it's for. Right. And when you start looking at the data, approximately 10% of individuals with a mild level hearing loss actually treat their hearing loss. Right. And so they really want to start like, okay, what's a way that we can get to this group of people, increase accessibility and affordability for them? Because maybe they don't have perceptually a $5,000 problem. Maybe yeah. they have a yeah. Twelve hundred dollar problem, mm -hmm. and that they can solve that with this particular legislation. Right, right, absolutely. Um, I mean, 
like you said, that's 10% of those with mild hearing loss are actually using a hearing aid. But we know better than anyone that you need, you still need treatment, essentially, even with a mild hearing loss. Like auditory stimulation up to the brain, consistent auditory stimulation is so, so important in keeping those connections alive, keeping them stimulated. Um, so that is a huge untapped market, essentially. And yeah, maybe they don't have a $5,000 problem, but they have a problem that could be solved with technology that's, you know, doesn't need to be as specific or specified or tuned in, if yeah, you will. Yeah, you know, and we, we treat individuals with mild hearing loss with prescriptive level hearing aids, but their perception is that they're having a significant amount of difficulty. Right. Um, and you can treat it and treat it really well. Uh, we'll see what happens with mm -hmm. OTC, though. Right? That we will. That's for sure. Now, um, I believe we're jumping into some of the actual rules and regulations that, that we hearing aid for even. Um, and so the FDA describes the OTC intended user, if you will, as a person who is over the age of 18 with m perceived, that's the key that's word there, perceived mild to moderate hearing loss. Um, who is an OTC hearing aid not for? Clearly not for. Right. So we have children under the age of 18. Sure. Yep. Right. So if you're a child and uh, if you're a parent of a child and you're thinking that you should go and get an OTC device off the shelf and treat your child, that is a no, no. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, like now, to my clear. knowledge, they are not requiring uh, proof of age for this because that would re potentially restrict accessibility. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're under the age of 18, no go on OTC. Um, and then the red flags. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of red flags that we look for when we're doing hearing testing. Some of them potentially you might not actually identify fully without proper evaluation, but right. if you explicitly identify that you're having a, a deformity, if you have a deformity or injury to your actual ear, uh, that is a red flag that you should not be using OTC for. And then the rest of them are if you have a lot of earwax or something actually stuck inside of your ear, guess what? And no hearing aid will help you. You have to get that removed before you can use anything. Right. Uh, you need, uh, if you have active pain or drainage from your ears, you cannot do OTC. If you have an asymmetrical hearing loss or tinnitus, or tinnitus, however you guys like to pronounce it, it's fine with me, but if you have either one of those things, you cannot use OTC devices. And just a fun fact here, if you have an asymmetrical hearing loss, there is potential that you have a tumor growing on your auditory nerve, so don't ignore it. Actually, go get it professionally evaluated. You'll thank me later. Yeah. Uh, a sudden change in hearing. If you have a sudden change in hearing, you need to go see a medical professional ASAP yeah. because you actually recovering from that sudden hearing loss uh, is uh, very time sensitive. Mm -hmm. So if you think that you're just gonna kind of push it off and oh, let me get an OTC device and put it in my ear, that right there will be horrible for you down the road. You have uh, very little chance of recovering your hearing if that happens. Mm -hmm. And then the last one here is vertigo or dizziness. If right. you have a lot of vertigo uh, and dizziness, that is something that uh, you would not want to actually go and try to self-treat. You want to go see a medical professional for that. Please do. Uh, you know, working at an ENT practice for a while there, saw a lot of sudden hearing losses, ones that, uh, you know, could have been treated in the moment and uh, then I see them you know nine weeks later that that treatment window was essentially gone at that point um, so again if you have something that changes really rapidly get it checked out please absolutely. please please absolutely yeah. so let's talk about the labeling requirements here a little bit right so um, as far as the actual labeling of these things just like any other product that you might go to the store and buy um, first of all OTC hearing aids must have OTC somewhere on the box. So that was actually kind of interesting that uh, they said you have to have these three letters on the box. There must be OTC somewhere. Um, also, if the devices are used or rebuilt, they must be very clearly labeled that they are rebuilt devices. So that's good. It's kind of weird though. I know. <laughs> I, I don't know if I would want to. You go back to Walgreens and you see like this box that's opened and it has a sticky note on it saying this has been used by someone else? Yeah, uh, not my favorite idea, but uh, it has to be at least labeled. So you, you at least get the, the choice there. Um, the battery information has to be on there. So whether it's a rechargeable device, whether it uses zinc air batteries, um, 
and then what operating system is needed to program the devices. So what's very interesting is that the devices will have this either self-fitting capacity um, where there's controls on the devices themselves or you need an external device like a smartphone or a laptop computer, something like that, to program the devices. And uh, it, the box does have to tell you what you The, the dizziness, the asymmetrical, all those things, those will be listed in and you need to have an instruction manual too. Good, yeah, so, that always helps. That always right. helps. How the heck are we gonna figure out how to program it without I an know. instruction manual? Um, all right, guys, so before we get into our next piece here, I do wanna talk about one of our other sponsors, ESCO. So uh, ESCO specializes in providing insurance coverage for your hearing aid. So what do you actually do when your hearing aid manufacturer warranty runs out? Well, you can actually get extended coverage through a company like ESCO. So ESCO has a couple of different programs for this. Uh, one of them is called the Protection Plus Plan. So if you want to get loss and damage insurance on your devices once you, your loss and damage expires from the manufacturer, mm -hmm. you can go through ESCO to get that coverage each year. Um, and so if you wanna have your hearing aids longer and use them longer, and if you lose them, have them replaced by ESCO so you don't have to pay for it out of your pocket, perfect situation for you there. Uh, you also have the option of the platinum plan, which is loss and damage and repairs. Mm -hmm. So if you happen to break your hearing aid or it just stops working on you, this particular plan will actually cover your hearing aids long after your manufacturer warranty has already expired. So, right. uh, you know, I tend to be a fan of making your hearing aids last as long as humanly possible. That's right. just my nature. Uh, so uh, really, ESCO allows you to do that. Um, ESCO is giving all Dr. Cliff show viewers a $10 gift card just for registering your hearing aids at esco.com forward slash Dr. Cliff and they will actually send you a reminder when your hearing aid warranty is about to expire. All right, guys, so what we like to do here is we actually like to highlight one of our Hearing Up providers. Now, if you do not know what Hearing Up is, Hearing Up is a network of hearing care professionals that are committed to following best practices. Now, best practices are those things that actually help you achieve a higher level outcome with your hearing aids, even your existing hearing aids. You go to a Hearing Up provider, you're gonna get additional benefits. So, who do we have for our Hearing Up provider spotlight this week? Today, we've got Dr. Amit Gasalia and uh, wow I uh, he sent me his his history his uh, CV if you will I mean and you ran out of hard drive space. I it was just about as long as this registered <laughs> document here so uh, Dr. Gasalia is a distinguished fellow of the National Academies of Practice and is an American Board of Audiology certified he received his AUD here in Arizona from AT Still University he is an extremely involved audiologist who serves as the Legislative and Membership and Communications Committee member for the California Academy of Audiology, a fellow of the American Academy of Audiology, uh, a member of the Academy of Doctors of Audiology, and the President Chair of Audvoss, and a consultant for numerous, numerous companies in the industry. So in the past, he served as the President for the Audiology Practice Standards Organization, president-elect of the Arizona Speech and Hearing Association, an adjunct professor at AT Still, and on a political action committee as the Arizona chair. Um, like I said, endless, endless, endless right. involvement It's too there. bad we lost him to California. I know, I know. He really has spent his entire career volunteering and, and leading in the pursuit of moving the profession forward, um, which is incredible, and continues to practice at the highest level of ethics and best practices, not only in clinic, but by educating audiologists and by also educating audiology students to secure the future of the field. So with that, we introduce you to Dr. Amit Gasalia. What's going on, guys? Can you hear me? Lag there for a second. Yeah, I know. There's always a lag here with the, live, with the live audio, but uh, nonetheless, uh, that is quite a long intro. Like I said, it was pretty upsetting that we lost you to the state of California. It would be great to have an excellent audiologist like yourself still out here in Arizona. But um, that being said, there's a lot of stuff going on from an OTC perspective, and I even saw you on the news uh, in LA there that you were interviewed on this, uh, this piece of legislation. So what are your thoughts overall on OTC hearing aids? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm glad you saw me on the interview and not the, the car chase that we usually get a bunch of car chases no here audio. in Los Angeles. No audio. 
I don't know. That's right. We're going to hang in there with you. So um, I know he's saying something that is quite riveting. So probably <laughs> super, super <laughs> profound. And, yeah. and, and we've had conversations, uh, I've had conversations with, with Dr. Gasalia before about OTC. And I think that a lot of us are kind of on the same wavelength when it comes down to it as hearing care professionals. I think a lot of us are in support of OTC um, to an extent, right? And, and the thing is, we don't want patients to actually suffer by going with OTC and not having a good result and then ultimately they just give up on care right. entirely. So I think that there are you know, some concerns that we would have, but in general, I think that the consensus at least that I get from other hearing care professionals is that over-the-counter is going to be a good thing overall for the treatment of hearing loss because when we think about like what's our enemy as a profession, our enemy is not like competition from OTC manufacturers, our enemy is hearing loss. Right. And so we want to attack hearing loss with whatever tool we possibly can. And if OTC is one of those tools, then I think that we, uh, I think that we're going to be better off for having it around. I think so too. And I think he'd agree. Am I on now? And no, he doesn't agree. He doesn't agree at all. <laughs> Cause I got no audio from Dr. Gatali. No, I'll tell you what. We might be able to get him back up here in a minute, but yeah. I think we should move on with our segment and we'll see if we can get Dr. Gasalia uh, back on because trust me, you guys are gonna wanna hear this guy talk. Uh, he is one of the smartest audiologists that I've ever met. So Absolutely. Um, that being said, it looks like we have another sponsor here. Yeah, let's say, let's just move straight on into uh, one of our sponsor segments here, uh, which would be Sound Oasis. So. Um, very, very many people struggle with tinnitus, um, ringing, buzzing, chirping, crickets, you know, all the things that, that we hear in clinic myself as well. I have tinnitus in my right ear um, and it can be really annoying, very bothersome, of course. So um, Sound Oasis is a company that has an entire lineup of sound therapy systems, sound generators, noise machines, people refer to them by, by other names, but um, they have an entire ecosystem, if you will, of, of sleep therapy options and incredible products, tabletop products, products that you can clip onto your waistband, um, products with uh, sound generators and clocks in them and alarm clocks and things like that. Um, I love this company. I love this brand. And uh, this is quite literally the sound speaker that look at this one right here <laughs> this one right here is actually the smallest Holy white cow. noise machine and it's uh, it does have to plug in and uses headphones but I mean this has a little clip on the waistband and so if you're working in an office even that's super quiet you can't just be playing something through a sound speaker in your cubicle if you will because you can't be bothering other people um, this clip is is awesome because you put it on there it's got some little earbuds and you can kind of really focus in I'm thinking like when I'm flying yeah absolutely like I think students too especially in places where you're not allowed to have a smartphone necessarily because you could be you know trying to cheat something like that yeah um, and so then this product would be perfect as don't well. even have to listen to your teacher anymore That's right perfect. right <laughs> so um, they've got an entire line of, of products like I said they're available at, at most retailers as well um, CVS uh, you know all the big box options um, but again they were kind enough to supply us with the promo code there so if you go to soundoasis.com and you use promo code sleep you can get a 20% discount on any of their products awesome thank you sound oasis all right so let's talk about some of the positives about OTCs now what do you think one of the positives are I mean, there's a lot of positives, definitely. Um, we talked earlier about accessibility, for sure. Um, affordability, all those fun things. Uh, I really think that regulation was needed. Regu like we were in a dire situation to get some sort of control over these devices because ultimately consumers were ending up with some very interesting products. I mean, you have done reviews on lots of these products um, where they come straight out of the packaging 
with essentially just a question mark. There's there's nothing that you need in the box to use them. There's a, you know no instruction manual, and who knows how loud that they can get. And so um, it has been nice to see them putting regulation on on these things for sure. Yeah, I think that's probably one of the biggest things is mm -hmm. that you know we could complain all we wanted to to regulators and all of that and. Every single time we did that, we just got a form letter back saying, oh, yeah, you know, we'll it's, look into it. we, we sent them a letter we'll to stop, yeah. you know, and that was or, or not even to stop. We sent them a letter saying, just don't do this stuff. Well, because there and was they no continue rules. to do it. Yeah, right. it was it was how, what are you going to get these people or these companies rather? What are you going to what are you going to catch them for when there's no rules in the space? Exactly. Right? There's there was nothing to enforce. There were literally people calling their news stations to say, hey, investigative team, can you check out this company because I'm supposed to be getting a refund for this piece yeah. of junk that was sent to me. And that's the only way they could get a refund I is if it. they made a big media uh, stink about I know, it. So, I know. you know, but I also think that another positive here is affordability. I mean, you are going to be able to get an affordable option to treat your hearing loss. Yep. Um, will that option, it's not like you're gonna be getting a premium level hearing aid for like, a very low price, mm -hmm. but you'll get a decent product at least because it's gonna to have to meet these guideline requirements. So you're gonna get a decent device and it is going to lower the cost of it because you do not have to go and see a hearing care professional. And then you are you probably will be able to get it in stores like Best Buy mm -hmm. and things like that, which also, also leads to the accessibility aspect. So if you don't have access to a hearing care professional, an audiologist, you could actually go and drive into your local store, whether it's Walgreens, Best Buy, whatever, and get a device there. You could increase accessibility by literally ordering them online, having mm -hmm. them shipped to your house if you live out in the middle of, I don't know, Wyoming yep. or something like right. that. So I think that that's uh, another one of the benefits. Yep, Absol absolutely. Um, I think what we're gonna try and do And, Dr. Uh, Gasalia, oh, we're ready. let's see if we got you now, buddy. I don't know. Can you hear me? No, <laughs> we don't. Oh. I don't have him. Oh, no. Okay, well, uh, I'm guessing what's going to happen here is that we may have a, a separate interview offline, mm -hmm. uh, or we'll just have him back on a different week. But yeah. uh, you guys definitely want to hear his thoughts on OTC. Um, he is one of the leaders inside of our profession. Um, and, and who knows, maybe he would agree or disagree with some of the positives and negatives we're going to be talking about. Here. Right? Right. I know. I definitely want to know his viewpoint on this. So um, whether it's this week, whether it's next week, whether it's a third, like I said, this is going to be a three episode series on pretty much all things OTC and prescription level hearing aids. So I feel like we can bring him right back on in for Absolutely. any one of those episodes because we got a lot to talk about with that. So. Yeah. Um, Going back to very quickly some of these positives about the OTC market, um, we talked about having them be, you know, more highly regulated, and I think that is a little bit broad of of a term. Um, when I'm talking about regulation, I'm talking about how loud can these devices actually go, and there's going to be a limit on that now, which is good because I, I'm sure that there were companies out there that were potentially damaging the hearing of, oh, yeah. of, of patients Clearly. Um, by just having output limits that were just well beyond safe levels, um, which was definitely a problem. You know, I, I, so when I was reviewing some of these, over, uh, sorry, not over the counter, but direct to consumer hearing aid like devices and and i should really just call them amplifiers because all they would do is increase or decrease volume yeah we know that a lot of individuals um uh do not have a flat hearing loss they have a high frequency sloping hearing loss or a unique configuration of hearing loss right and the thing that i like about this regulation here of establishing these things like output regulate or limit limitations mm -hmm. on the devices having volume controls and and having programmability and things like that is that it's actually going to increase the quality of these of products these devices, absolutely. right because there was so much garbage out there and that was there is and there probably will continue to be garbage out there mm -hmm. um in this regulation as long as you are buying a product that has the proper labeling requirements right and has actually um you know achieved the standard of an otc hearing aid you can rest assured that that hearing aid will be largely safe yeah for you to use yep 
and it would be from a relatively reputable company. Right. 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 And so that's the great thing about this is that it actually creates some kind of standard that people, at least a minimum standard, that people, that companies have to live up to yep. when they're actually creating these products. Yep. A higher level standard and a higher level of competition, which will basically force a lot of these companies to really dial in their technology. That's right. Do better. So that's great. You know, do because better. nothing has forced them to do better at this point. Right. Exactly. Um, and then, of course, getting getting to patients earlier in their journey. And that's what we talked about earlier about patients with mild hearing loss. So many of them are waiting until it's moderate or moderately severe or severe. It's just way too long from onset of symptoms, you know, difficulty hearing in, in certain environments and things like that, um, to when they actually get those hearing aids. We know that the research says that the average time between when you are aware that you have a hearing loss and when you actually do something about it is generally between seven and 10 years, um, which is way too long. So, Way too long. Yeah. And I'm glad to see that that number is actually shortening. When you start looking at a lot of individuals, they're making the decision to treat their hearing loss substantially earlier. But this potentially accelerates that even further. Mm -hmm. When someone, because here's the thing, never have I ever met someone who treated their hearing loss with hearing aids and was and later said, this was the worst decision of my life. Yeah, no. It doesn't happen. No. Like when people treat their hearing loss, they're like, how did I not treat this sooner? Yep. And so if this acts as a, a nice stepping stone to individuals at least kind of testing out mm -hmm. the waters. Now we were gonna jump into some of the negatives here for a moment. Um, let's see. What we've got up here, we've got, um, you know, the use of the word perceived. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was kind of interesting where uh, there is no test, there is no standardization. It's uh, if you think that you have a mild to moderate hearing loss, then you can use this product. Or this I don't know how many patients you. though that I've had that have had a severe hearing loss and they think they don't even have a hearing loss, they're only there because their spouse has made them come right? in. Right, exactly. So, so being able to self-identify or self-diagnose essentially mm -hmm. without any kind of testing is a little fishy. Right. right, it's like how do we know, no one has a, a standard to compare their hearing loss to, right? Right. Like what is normal, what's not normal? Um, how, who do you compare that to, right? You can't just take someone else's ears, use them for a minute and go, oh yeah, yeah that sounds pretty good. Yeah, that sounds right? better than what I have. Uh, you can't. So yeah. that, that could have used a little bit more dialing in, but again, that's all about the accessibility standpoint where right. there is not the need of these formal assessments to... You know, listen, uh, you know, the FDA forward, has so. made it very clear that they are willing to let some people fall through the cracks right in mm -hmm. order to serve the larger majority yep. and i can see where they're coming from with that as much as i might not l feel comfortable saying that but i can understand where they're coming from with definitely that. definitely um, Definitely. So I also think there's a couple of other things that we need to talk about from a negative standpoint. I think that lack of medical intervention, if it goes unidentified, mm -hmm. so a particular type of hearing loss that either cannot be treated with hearing aids or needs medical intervention before treatment with hearing aids, and you saw this all the time working at an ENT clinic. Absolutely, I saw it all the yeah. time when I was doing my externship working in an otology clinic. Mm -hmm. So that's a concern. Uh, you know, whether or not someone's a true candidate or not, I mean, I think that there's probably some children that are going to find their way into OTC hearing aids. That's unfortunate. But again, that is a risk that the FDA is willing to take with this. I think that they're probably the biggest thing that I'm worried about is having uh, a poor outcome for a patient or an individual mm -hmm. with an OTC device and they say, see, I told you hearing aids wouldn't work for me. Right. When really you just needed properly fit hearing aids and properly programmed hearing aids. It's probably one of my bigger concerns with this is just that um, I have seen a lot of the one and done mentality out in the field where um, patients will, you know, try one device and it doesn't work and, and that's it in their mind. Now, most of the time I can end up convincing them, let's give it another shot, let's get you programmed correctly, let's get you fit correctly and let's follow this best practice timeline. Um, but easier said than done with some individuals um, and we, of course, have to get them into the clinic to convince them otherwise. True. If we can't get them into the clinic, who knows if they'll ever end you know and i've had in successful again, individuals so. person, purchasing direct to consumer hearing aids not having success coming into the clinic and we're actually able to modify the programming and they actually have better success with 
the direct-to-consumer hearing aids, I think that that is going to be a significant aspect of OTC, right. where individuals, and if you're watching the show, like just know that if you are going to go the OTC route, I'm totally cool with it. But if you don't have success, please take that in to see a hearing care professional. Take mechanically they're functioning the right way and to make sure that they're actually programmed the right way which is another concern that I have is that if you try to do all this self-fitting stuff yeah. you are not going to get realer measurement mm -hmm. right so you're not going to have the hearing aids programmed to your prescriptive target for your hearing loss and we know that having the proper audibility and having the hearing aids programmed to your prescription for your hearing loss is like the number one thing paramount yep that for sure. when you start looking at benefit for yep. hearing aids and it's going to be no different with OTC the question will become is that something that you're going to be able to do just by tweaking it and listening to it or are you going to need to make sure that that fitting is actually verified. Right, right. So I'll wrap up this negative section just by saying too that it has been hard to kind of see uh, so many media releases about these OTC hearing aids right now where, you know, we've got hearing aid, hearing aid, hearing aid. That's great. I love that visibility. But unfortunately, what we keep seeing over and over is hearing healthcare professionals referred to as a, a hassle or a, a waste of time or uh, in a, you know, just another factor. Um, I don't see us that way, and maybe I'm biased, right? Um, but I, I think that it's important for people to know that if an OTC device is not serving you entirely, um, please see a professional. Like, we can help you through this for sure, so. You know, when you look at treatment acceptance rates, you know, inside of clinics who follow best practices, mm -hmm. you start looking at like 99 percent treatment success rate mm -hmm. in a lot of these clinics. Now, the standard in the industry is what, like 80 percent? Right. Right. So, but you have to make sure that you go to a professional that's doing things the right way. That's why we started Hearing Up Network. You guys can see it here on my laptop there. Um, and the, the last thing I want to touch base on before we get into some of your guys' questions. So if you have questions, make sure that you start asking them now on the chat. Um, but is the market penetration, the one thing that everyone thinks is going to happen here is that OTC hearing aids are going to make it so everyone with hearing loss can get hearing aids. Mm -hmm. But there are countries out there that supply free prescription hearing aids to mm -hmm. all of their citizens. And the highest penetration rates that they have is like in the 40s. Yeah. Right. And the United States is in the 30s. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you might increase the treatment rate by about 10% with OTC, but there's a lot of work that has to be done to make sure that the rest of the individuals uh, actually get treated uh, for their hearing yep. loss, right? Absolutely, absolutely. All right, before we jump into questions, we have one last sponsor segment, and I'm turning it over to you. Right on. So we've got Resound here again. So they just released their new Omnia hearing aid. Now, if you guys are not familiar with this hearing aid yet, make sure that you check out my review of the Resound Omnia hearing aid on my YouTube channel, plus all the other six. 600 videos that I've got mm -hmm. on there at this point. Um, but these hearing aids were specifically designed for better speech understanding and background noise. I have personal experience with using these at a noisy conference. I can tell you that from a background noise reduction perspective, the front focus mode feature that they have on this hearing aid is fantastic. But one thing I do want to point out is that uh, Resound, uh, which is their parent company is GN. GN has already been in this self fitting hearing aid space for, I don't know, maybe about a year now uh, with the Jabra Enhance Plus. Mm -hmm. So if you guys want to check out my review of the Jabra Enhance Plus device, uh, hearing aid, you can actually check that out on my channel as well. Um, and you know, if you want to get a pair of those hearing aids, you can go to any certified Jabra Enhance Center. And you know, again, if you're in the position of, you're not sure if you can do it all by yourself, if you're not sure if you want to go the full-on prescriptive hearing aid route, this is a nice middle ground for you because you can still get some professional assistance mm -hmm. with the Jabra Enhanced Plus hearing, self-fitting hearing aids. For sure. So if you are interested in either the Resound Omnia or the Jabra Enhanced Plus devices, make sure that you go check them out at resound.com. All right, so now we get to my favorite part, which are the questions. And one thing I do know here is that we have Kelsey, who is our resident audiologist. Hey, guys. And hey. <laughs> thanks for having and, and we can hear you. Yes, 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 I snuck in here a little bit ago, so it's nice to get to talk to all of you, get to answer some of your guys' questions yes. today. This entire uh, podcast, so thank you very much for your participation today. Um, 
there is one thing that kind of piggybacks off of what you guys were just talking about with, you know, being able to talk to a hearing care professional, even with OTC hearing aids. Um, a couple people have mentioned that they think the perception may be that unless you bought the hearing aid from the professional, that they won't be willing to help you adjust them in any way. What are your guys' thoughts on that within the audiology community? Yeah, I mean, I think that the vast majority, the vast majority of audiologists are going to be more than happy to work with these individuals. Again, you have to remember why audiologists got into the profession of audiology. Mm -hmm. We didn't get into it to sell hearing aids. Right. We got into it to treat hearing loss because that is one of the senses that you can restore that has a significant impact on somebody's life. For sure. Right. And so I think that uh, I know for me, for you, mm -hmm. we've talked about this, right? Mm -hmm. um, if someone has an OTC device, and they're not having success with it, please come into our clinic. If we can make those devices work better for you, we will do that. Yep. If they are not capable of meeting your needs, we will tell you that. Yep. And then you can decide what you ultimately want to do. And I think that that is the exact same approach from all of the hundreds of audiologists that I've talked to about OTC devices. I think that's what they're going to do too. I have yet to hear of a single hearing healthcare professional who has written off OTC devices entirely and has said, if anyone walks into my clinic with one of those, I'm not touching it. I'm not looking at it. Uh, that's just not the case. Like there's going to be uh, some factors that we cannot modify, right? So we are, of course, constrained to the limitations of the device itself. Mm -hmm. um, if we can't go in there and change the programming on something, we literally just can't go in there and change the programming on it. But if we can help you with fit issues, if we can help you with programming, we will. Like, um, I think it's important that if you're not seeing the success uh, with an OTC device that you were looking for, see a professional that can help guide you to that next step. So hopefully that was convincing enough for you guys. <laughs> like there's gonna be help out there. If that's Most the route definitely. that you want to go, go that route, but do not quit on it if it's not working out for you. Go see a professional. If you can't find someone in your local area, travel out. You can go to, again, you can go to hearingup.com and find a hearing care professional there. Every single one of the Hearing Up members would be happy to help you with your OTC hearing aids. For sure. Yeah, I think that definitely covers you know, at least five or six people's different questions. So thank Perfect. you guys for really elaborating there as well. Um, uh, do you think that this will lead insurance companies to cover hearing aids in any capacity, more mm. so than they already are for some people? Man, you know, I haven't thought about hearing aid insurance in a long time because <laughs> I, just I, about that because I, I like, don't <laughs> like how insurance companies try to dictate care. Right. Um, I, you know, if it increases it, I don't know. Honestly, it has the potential of, of making it less coverage mm -hmm. when you think about it. That's what it. I was going to say because an entire pillar of an OTC device is to remove the professional from it. And who can bill insurances? I don't know how you even get insurance to cover anything without a diagnosis code. Yeah. And you I, can't self-diagnose. I right. can't see insurance jumping in on this at all. Um, I mean, no, I, I think that requires the inclusion of a professional. Companies uh, that would provide hearing aid insurance is that they're looking for any way possible to reduce the costs you know, that mm -hmm. they have to pay out, yeah. right? Um, and maybe they, they try to reduce the rate and say, hey, you know, instead of fitting your patients with a prescriptive hearing aid, we're gonna just directly mail them OTC devices, you know, for whatever uh, fifth of the cost or whatever mm -hmm. the case may be. In fact, you actually kind of see some insurance companies doing this that right now. Yeah. Um, I'm fully aware of an insurance company that's like, you know what, don't don't go see a hearing care professional. We'll just send you devices yep. in the mail. Yep. And then you're like, well, what the heck do I do with these? Right? Uh, well, you know, not our problem. You're on yeah. your own, right? you essentially. Know. Yeah. Um, hopefully all the talk about hearing aids in general will uh, maybe, you know, trigger some, some changes there. Um, but yeah, definitely uncertain at the moment, I think. Yeah, it's definitely one of those it remains to be seen right. concepts. Right. Um, I have another question for you as well. Will audiologists actually be recommending this technology for patients that they see? I think so. I mean, for the right candidate, I think yes. Um, I mean, of course, I'd always like to work with a, a hearing aid that has the amount of customizations that I need to make sure that the patient is is getting through that process well and, and not just like kind of well, like really, really well, obtaining the maximum amount of benefit. If I don't feel like I can do that with an OTC device, then maybe I'll have a different recommendation. Um, I just want to make sure that the wrong people aren't 
ending up with them in their hands, you know, children and, and things like that. You know, I've spoken to a lot of audiologists at this point, and I know that there are a number of them who are like, this is great. We're going to have them inside of our clinic. It will be an option for certain individuals with mm -hmm. affordability issues, right? Um, because never, in my opinion, never will an OTC device outperform a prescriptive hearing aid, right? right? Mm -hmm. it, if maybe someday it comes to just as good, but it will never outperform, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I know that there's gonna be some clinicians who choose to have it in their clinic as an option. Um, I listened to a talk from Dr. Mike Valente just yesterday, who is like one of my role models inside of this profession. He has now been retired for a couple of years. Uh, he was out at, at Wash U uh, in Missouri. And um, he was actually one of the advisory board members for when I started the Hearing Up Network. Mm -hmm. um, but he was talking about how at Wash U, they were actually dispensing prescriptive hearing aids at a really, really low like entry base price. And it didn't come with a lot of services. So, you know, you didn't, you couldn't get everything with it. Um, but I think that that type of model is gonna work its way into a lot more clinics. As for our clinic, so I can speak directly for us because I'm the owner of Applied Hearing <laughs> Solutions. I can say that um, by the, our clinic is a little bit different. By the time individuals come in to see us, they want like top notch, best of everything, mm -hmm. right? Spend a lot of time on the OTC, like dispensing them. Like right. we'll help you with them, but dispensing them, I don't know. I think that we will be more in the, if you go to AppliedHearingAZ.com or DrCliffAUD.com or HearingUp.com, we will likely be dispensing OTC devices through that channel, right? You know, right? And then if you want to bring them into us, we'll probably do that. But right. Right. All right, guys, this has been fantastic. Yes. Kelsey, it's fantastic having you yes. on the show here really as well. To be we got to do this more often, <laughs> right? Uh, and we will do this more often because we'll see you next week. That's right. <laughs> um, oh, one quick thing before we go we did have a winner of the mug that we'll be sending you. Correct. So who was that winner? The winner for our mug giveaway is Arnie Carlson. He was a live watcher at our last podcast. So Arnie, if you're out there live again today, uh, go ahead and contact us so we can get you your mug. That's awesome. And you can call us at the clinic at Applied Hearing AZ uh, or go to AppliedHearingAZ.com and send us a message. Uh, give us your address and we'll send it off to you. But that is all the time that we have for today, guys. Thank you so much for joining us on this live podcast. Uh, please excuse the hiccups that we had today. But uh, hey, we'll see you next week. We'll see you next week.